You're listening to The Western Rookie, a hunting podcast full of tips, tricks, and strategies from seasoned Western hunters. There are plenty of opportunities out there. We just need to learn how to take on the challenges. Hunting is completely different up there. I've harvested 26 big game animals. You can fool their eyes, but you can't fool their nose. The 300 yards back to the road turned into three miles back the other way. It's always cool seeing new hunters go and harvest an animal. I don't know what to expect. If there's anybody I want in the woods with me, it'll be you. Welcome back to another Western Rookie Podcast episode. I'm your host, Brian Krebs, and today I have Stephen Lines on the call from Master the Hunt. And so, Stephen, I was looking for podcast guests, and your last two Instagram posts did it for me. You apparently are a coos. Is that coos deer that you're hunting? Yep. Coos deer. Cow's deer. Uh, Uh, Yeah. Depending on who you are. (laughs) Depending on who you are. Which one do you say? We'll do it the right way. Uh, If you're down in Arizona, the locals will say coos deer. If I feel like if you're anywhere else, the uh, correct uh, is cow's deer, but the locals will say coos deer. So, yeah, I've always heard coos deer, which I think Mm -hmm. is the like, common name but uh, people try to claim like the person that first saw and named the deer was something something cows cows was his last name and so they're like well technically it should be cows then because that's his name and everyone's like yeah i don't know coos deer sounds better yeah yeah i think it does (laughs) so but what i do know about coos deer is that the ones that you have on your story are monsters they're very large bucks. I mean, they're, it's a smaller deer, smaller antlers, but you got two dandy bucks here on your story and looks like you're, you're pretty successful. Do you do the, is this like an annual part of your, your fall or what do you do in there? Um, I try to make it an annual thing. Uh, so I live down in Southern Arizona and, uh, we have probably more coos deer than anything else. And, uh, usually every year I'm pretty good about getting a tag. And I say that as this year, I don't have a rifle tag, so I'll be just archery hunting. But uh, yeah, I try to make it a every year kind of thing, but we'll see how it goes this year. So far, it's been a little slow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a, I mean, the it's a bummer not having the rifle, but it the coos deer is over the counter with an archery, right, Hermit? Right. And yeah. so I've heard a lot of, I think they've got some good marketing uh, managers in the last five, 10 years, the coos deer. Cause mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that are like, guys, did you know you can just come to Southern Arizona in January and wear t-shirts and hunt deer and you know, no one, nothing else is going on. It's over the counter, great weather, great mm-hmm. times, watch out for rattlesnakes. But other than that, it's a great hunt. And everyone's like, Oh, I didn't even know. And now it's like the coolest thing to go coos deer hunting. Yeah, I feel like it was pretty unknown for a long time. And then, like you said, the last five, seven years, it's just absolutely blown up. So much so that they they kind of changed the format a little bit. We have, like, quotas now. It's still over the counter, but each unit has, like, a quota. And if so many bucks get killed, they'll shut the unit down. But still, it's it's a good opportunity. And, and I mean, there's not a whole lot else to do in December, January. So, and the nice thing is when you do shoot one, it's considerably easier to pack out than say a Arizona bull. It is so much easier. <laughs> In fact, I, you know, I've killed bucks before where we just gutted them and you throw them over your shoulder and carry them back to the truck. And that's probably my favorite part about these coos deer is yeah, you don't get a lot of meat in the freezer and they do taste delicious, but you don't kill yourself getting them out either. So <laughs> do you do antelope hunting? Um, a little bit, uh, here in Arizona, the antelope tags are super hard to get. In fact, I've yeah. never even drawn one. I killed a, uh, about an 80 inch buck with my bow in New Mexico a few years back. And then I've done Wyoming as well, but not a huge antelope hunter just because tags are kind of hard to get around here. But yeah, that's fair. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the size of a coos deer buck versus an antelope buck, because a lot of people are very familiar with antelope. So if you can, gotcha. are they like the same size? Is the antelope even bigger? I, I'd say a big mature coos buck's probably about the size of a an antelope. But I, again, I've killed coos deer before that body size. I mean, they're 
maybe closer to the size of like a large German shepherd or something. Like they can be very tiny, but if you get a big, big body, okay. big mature buck, I'd say it's about the size of, you know, an antelope. It's pretty close. So they're the largest of them can almost like, you know, so typically right. you may be like, maybe more like an antelope doe is the yeah, average that's, size. That's probably, the, that's probably closer. Yeah. Just to give people a reference of, it looks exactly like a whitetail. And they, and you know, like white tails have different looks everywhere you go. Um, you know, I'm from Minnesota, so you get, you know, a different look in Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Canada, you get real big body deer. I mean, especially the farther North you go, the bigger the deer body gets. Um, I would say to me, coos deer have always looked like a Texas white tail. You know, they have shorter fur. Um, they're a little bit skinnier, but then they're just, you know, even that they're one step smaller, like, the, you know, but they, it's almost like they have, it just looks like a Southern whitetail and it's hard to tell. Cause you never see, um, two of them. So it's hard <laughs> to see, like when you just see a picture of a coos deer on the hoof, all of the proportions match. Right. And so it looks like it's just an average eight point whitetail until you get up close to them. And then when you, or like your pictures where you, where you're sitting there behind the deer, then you can start to see. Oh, this is something different. This is a different, this is a different right. animal. Yeah. And those pictures, I'm probably kind of long arming them too. Uh, you really, it's like when you kill an elk, you walk up to it and it's like, man, these things are a lot bigger than you think. Coosier is the opposite. You walk up and it's like, man, this is so much smaller than what it even looks like, you know, through my binoculars or whatever. And that happens every time I kill one and they always, you know, <laughs> how much as you get closer to them but yeah well i suppose like here in the midwest like I, we own a farm we just bought a farm and actually my wife just shot a little update for all the listeners my wife just shot the first deer off of our new farm so we bought a 40 acre farm this year um we've been in three and a half months and we've done some food plotting we've got some stands i'm building a stand later tonight you know because we do like stand hunting here mm -hmm. and my wife just shot our very first deer off the farm this past Saturday with the early antler this season. So that's a pretty nice milestone. Um, her second deer ever. So that's yeah. another big milestone. And then obviously first year on the farm. So mm -hmm. fun things are happening here. Um, but where I was going with that is, you know, it's willow swamp. I mean, there's like alder and, you know, willow at 10 feet tall. And so I'm always worried about blood trails and finding them because it's a jungle. But I mm -hmm. suppose with the coos deer, it's the same thing, but it's not because it's a jungle. They're just small animals. Like it dies behind a rock and you're never going to see it unless you walk around that side of the rock. And you're like, I thought it was right here. Where'd it go? <laughs> yeah, I, I've shot bucks before. In fact, I think it was one of the ones in those pictures you were mentioning. You know, I shot him with a rifle. I think it was like 450, 500 yards. And I was by myself, solo hunt, backpacked in, and I went up to go get him. And like, I very vividly remember the rock he died right next to. And I still had almost stepped on him before I found him. I mean, they just blend in so good and they're so small. They can hide behind, you know, a bush and you'll never see them ever. Well, and that's one of the, the things that people say about coos deer, even when they are alive and they're standing, is you still hardly can't find them. I mean, if you, I've heard a lot of people say, like, once you find a buck, do not take your eyes off of it you know, make sure you get them bedded. Otherwise you're never going to see them again. Right. Yeah. They, they can definitely disappear quick. I mean, I've, I've had instances where I've been watching the deer and it could be the wide, wide open country and they will just disappear in five seconds. And I'll sit there the rest of the morning watching, like, I know he's in here and sure enough, hours later pop up out of nowhere. And it's like, man, he was probably behind, a cactus or a bush this entire time. I just couldn't see him. Yeah. And so uh, it's not like an elk where, I mean, I feel like you can see them from miles away. These oh, things well. are <laughs> hard to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and so that like with a rifle, obviously you find your, if you see the deer, you find it, you get within rifle distance. And if you can still see it, you know, through the scope, great. You're in the money, you know, take mm -hmm. your shot, do all the things. But when you're archery hunting, I mean, how, Walk us through like what your average archery hunt looks like. Cause I feel like it's impossible to find a deer with your binos or with your spotter, say 500 yards away. And now we got to walk 450 yards. We're definitely going to lose sight. Like, obviously we have to lose sight or we're never going to 
sneak up on them. So we have to get behind something. And then how do you refine the deer? Uh, most of the time you don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> archery is really tough with these things. I, I grew up hunting these things, archery. Um, what we would do is we'd hunt them like Eastern whitetail. We'd go sit tree stands and mm. uh, in the higher elevations. Uh, when I turned like 16 and could drive myself and go hunt by myself, I kind of transitioned into spot and stock going down into the lower country with my binos. And that's a lot more challenging in my opinion, but uh, you just got to do your best to remember your landmarks. And it's, it's a lot easier during December, January, when the bucks will start pairing up with the does that way you have three or four animals to kind of keep track of they're easier to refine i guess you could say yeah it, it gives you a little more eyes and ears you gotta you know get around but at the same time they don't disappear as quickly but uh during august the august archery hunt it can be really tough because they'll lay down in just a little patch of shade and you may never see them again the rest of the day so it can it can be tough spot and stock for sure do they generally bed down long enough for you to get a stock in because i've also heard that they just they move a lot especially uh, during the rut yeah december january they're they're always on the move and that, that's what makes it tough as well your best bet's almost to just kind of go where you think they're gonna go and just let them come to you um in august they'll they'll bed down most of the day with how hot it is you know so you, it's almost a little easier spot and stock if you go archery in august than december january but in august you're dealing with the heat you're dealing with rattlesnakes you're dealing with you know deer that are only active maybe the first 10 minutes of the morning and then they're mm -hmm. laying down the rest of the day so I, I prefer december january but it can be it has its own challenges with it so well out of all of those reasons i will pick january for just one and that's the rattlesnakes yeah <laughs> i do not like snakes uh, since buying this farm i've found two new species of snakes so in minnesota typically just have garter snakes mm -hmm. the normal black and yellow lined ones well we found an eastern hognose snake which looks a lot like a rattlesnake and one of their defense mechanisms is actually to flatten their head and make it look like a v to make them look like a viper or a rattlesnake like that's their mm -hmm. defense mechanism i'm like well it backfired on you because i thought you were a rattlesnake and i killed you <laughs> um and then we found a red belly snake and so i'm like jesus where are all these snakes i've never seen this many snakes in minnesota but mm -hmm. we're in lower you know wetter ground at probably where the snakes like to be and so um but the rat like fortunately we don't have any rattlesnakes near me and the places i've hunted you know there could be one but they're not very popular. Nothing like, you know, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, like the tr Nebraska, the true rattlesnake states. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, you know, as you're running around in Southern Arizona, how many rattlesnakes do you, you know, do you encounter in an average fall? Um, you, I personally, I've lived here my whole life. I've never ran across one in December or January. So that's okay. why those are my two favorite months to hunt. That's positive. Uh, in addition to the <laughs> rut and the weather and everything else, December, January, you're good. I have ran into plenty in October, even November. Um, I don't know. I'm probably running into two or three every, every season. So they're not super common, but they're common enough to where when you almost step on one, it like ruins the rest of your day. Ruin, like, you know what I mean? Your, your eyes are glued to the ground and you're not really looking at anything else after that so well especially so now i'm getting so spot and stock archery in august so there's mm -hmm. snakes around and you're gonna run into like you said like one or two a season two or three a season it's like enough that like you can't just be crawling around trying to sneak up on a bed of deer like how do you <laughs> do you still crawl around you just spend a lot more time looking to make sure there's not a snake or what do you do um if it's not too hot i'll wear snake gaiters um okay not that i don't know i they should work i haven't been bit yet i haven't you know with them on but yeah i gotta test it out <laughs> no, i'm not gonna test it either but they they work really good for the brush and cat claw as well so i do i do like wearing them when i can when it makes sense yeah but they are a lot they are really hot so i don't wear them that often in fact i didn't even wear them this august um 
but I am a little more careful on like the places I am hunting. If I, it looks really rocky and thick, I'm definitely a lot more careful on where I'm stepping and kind of my path I'm choosing to go when it gets to, you know, I need to go over to this ridge to get on this deer. I'm going to go this way instead of that way, if that makes sense. And it maybe, maybe I shouldn't think that way, but I've almost stepped on enough throughout the years that I hate snakes too. They're by far my least favorite thing in the world. And I will, if it takes me an extra five minutes, you know, to go around, go through a wash where I can, you know, have flat level ground to walk on versus cutting across a, a real thick grassy patch of whatever, I'll go the opposite direction. <laughs> Yikes. So, so like in New North Dakota, I almost said New Mexico and I don't know why, but North Dakota, you can get over the counter archery mule deer tags as a resident. And so you just apply, you buy your tag. Um, and But a lot of times, like, you, you're probably going to have to crawl at some point. Like, hands and knees crawl because it's it's pretty open. You know, it's not woods. Or sometimes there's not brush to hide behind. So there's a good chance you might have to crawl on your hands and knees to get within that 40-yard shot window. Right. And I, even in North Dakota, I mean, there's rattlesnakes in North Dakota, so I'm a little bit concerned. But I've done it. Never saw a snake. But in a place like Southern Arizona, are you ever actually like crawling on your hands and knees to sneak up on something if you had to, or are you like not worth it with the amount of snakes? If I get busted, I get busted. Uh, I've never actually really had to crawl with deer. Okay. Um, I, I think there's enough brush and enough elevation changes. You can usually kind of put, you know, a tree or something, you know, a rocky bluff in between you and usually I'm pretty good at getting within range of something without having to get on my hands and knees. I I have done it in the past, but it's not something I'm ever having to regularly do. So not that I want to either. (laughs) No, I mean, that would be my fears. You're crawling in, you're looking, all of a sudden you look down and you're like face to face with a rattlesnake Mm -hmm. in striking distance. And it's like, uh, you know, whack. Right. Right in the face. I mean, that would be awful. (laughs) Yeah. So do you, um, What's the, what's the rules on rattlesnakes in the Southwest? Like, are they protected? Are they? I think there might be some species that are, but most of the ones you'll see, you, you can kill. So yeah, a lot of people say that like you're experienced. (laughs) (laughs) I, I try not to let too many go (laughs) one less rattlesnake to worry about, but, uh, yeah, a lot of people, they, they enjoy killing them and they'll eat them and keep the skins and everything else. Like they'll eat them. Yeah. I mean, I know people, I know like you could eat a snake, like if you had to, you would survive, but I don't know people like actively go out and, you know, hunt snakes for food. Yeah. A lot of people will kill them too when they're out like quail hunting. So it's quail season right now. So you're out walking around, uh, looking for quail and a lot get killed this time of year. And a lot of people will bring them back and skin them out and fry them up. So I don't do that. I, I'm i not a huge fan. I've done it in the past, but I'm not a huge fan of it. So I would love a rattleskin or a rattlesnake skin hat band for one of my cowboy hats. I don't want any part of doing it myself, though. <laughs> I would want to kill the snake. I would use two long sticks to put it in a bucket, and I would bring it to someone and be like, here, turn this into a hat band for me. I don't even, even if it's dead, I don't even want to touch it. I, Mm -hmm. I, um, I do not enjoy the snakes, but I'm now I'm curious because there's been a lot of controversy. People are thinking that because the rattlesnakes that rattle typically get killed, Mm -hmm. that they're worried rattlesnakes are going to quit rattling. And then all of a sudden we've, you know, we've caused evolutionary change that rattlesnakes no longer rattle because they don't want to die. And now you're running around, you'll never know where they are again. And then you just start getting bit. (laughs) What's your thoughts on that? Because you're local, you have insight that we don't have. I think there might be some truth to that. It seems like the last four or five I've ran into haven't made a sound, you know, and and even threatened. In fact, I killed one a few weeks ago now. I have a little bike that I'll take around at night and, you know, just go for a little ride to try to get a little exercise in. And, uh, I actually accidentally ran it over on my bike. Ooh. So I stopped and went, Oh yeah, that was a, a rattlesnake. It was a real, it was a small one, but it didn't rattle at all. It coiled up, but didn't rattle oh. at all. And it was definitely feeling threatened, but 
didn't rattle. So I wonder if that was because of how fast you came in, like on a bike. That might have had something to do with it. Yeah, or at at night. I don't know. Maybe they're colder. They don't want to move. I don't know. But yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah, and I don't like them. And I I think there is truth to that. I, I don't think. I don't think they rattle as often as people think they, they do. At least well, that's, that I've encountered. <laughs> well, that's terrifying. <laughs> and so to think about it, like, I would say it seems like 90% of the poisonous snakes in America are rattlesnakes. And then you get into some water moccasins in the east, and I'm sure there's a couple others. But mm-hmm. for the most part, all of our poisonous snakes let you know that they're poisonous, or they're supposed to. Like, they're supposed to rattle, and then we have this, like, mutual understanding, like, Either you stay there, I'll stay here, or I'm going to kill you. One or the other. I don't care which one. But like right. either way, we're, I'm not going to get bit, except for the water moccasins, and that's Florida's problem. I mean, they got to figure that out on their own. But like, imagine living in a place like Africa or Australia where there's like way more poisonous snakes and none of them rattle. Like you're not going to get this little handy dandy, you know, notification that you're about to get bit by a poisonous snake. <laughs> like imagine life living with that kind of pressure of like trying to be out and hunting and there's just any, at any moment, a snake could bite you. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to live in a world like that. <laughs> you know, I'd be awful. We, you know, we don't encounter them enough to where like, I feel like they're a huge problem, but again, they, the last couple ones I ran into don't rattle. So I try to avoid them at all costs. <laughs> well, and that's the worst. That's the, like, to me, that's the worst danger of like, they're there, but we don't really encounter them that often, but we still encounter them every year. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you hunt elk outside of Yellowstone in, like, northwest Idaho, or, or sorry, northwest Montana, you nobody hunts elk there without spray or a pistol or both. Most of the time it's both, right, because right. of the grizzly bears. Mm-hmm. Like, you, it's unheard of to elk hunt out there, out like, alone, or maybe some people do it alone, but without bear protection. And it's because, like, that's such a big deal that you, it's just, like, you have to do it. You go to the bathroom at night, you have to bring your bear spray. You have to put your food away from your tent. You just, all these things you have to do. Because if you mess them up, the bear is going to, like, that's not good. It's going to kill you. Right. But the snake, it's like, well, I don't know. We should wear snake boots, but we don't see that many of them. And then all of a sudden, whack, because you weren't wearing your boots, you get hit. And I'm just like, that's the worst kind of predator. One that makes you, like, slack off because it's not that big of an issue, but could still mess up your life if you got bit by one. Yeah, that, that's probably a good way to put it. Like I said, I didn't wear my snake gaiters this year. I was like, ah, they're too hot. I'm not really hunting any areas that are real thick and nasty, so I'll, I'll be good without them. And I didn't encounter any, but watch, I'm going to go out next weekend scouting, and sure enough, I'll, I'll run into one or almost step on one. <laughs> well, I sure hope you don't. <laughs> and I just, I don't know. Yeah, maybe like some type of like lightweight, but breathable snake gator, I don't know, maybe like an anti-venom lined pant. So as soon as you get bit, like it also administers the anti-venom. Or, you know what I mean? Like just crazy. You know, I know like the act of actually getting bit is a lot more fear. Like it's not, it's going to feel mm-hmm. like someone hit you with a hammer, which I've hit myself with a hammer before and I'm here to tell the tale. So it's not like that's the end of the world, but also the fear. But, and then every like just logistically, like antivenom costs a shit ton getting to a hospital if you have to get flighted out because you're deep in and it starts to swell up. I mean, there's just endless things that could go wrong. And it's just like, I'm going to have a medical bills for years, you know, right. if you get bit by a snake. And it's just all of these things that I'm just, none of it's good. Like none of it's positive. At least when you're hunting grizzly bear country, they got big elk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've thought about that for years. I was like, I, there's got to be some way to create like a real breathable and lightweight gator that's also, you know, needle proof, essentially, you know, because that's what their their fangs are, super small and thin. But I haven't thought of it yet. But when I do, I mean, that's maybe my next million dollar idea. But you're right that it's the it's not going to kill you, but it's the aftermath of potentially getting bit by one that man just don't even want to think about (laughs) no and i've heard that dogs for the most part to shake it off after a few days like it'll mess them up for a bit but you don't really have to do much they'll just find it off but people like if you don't get the antivenom there's a good chance like it can kill you 
Yeah, or at the very least, you might get, you know, something amputated. But, well, you know, I've had plenty of dogs growing up get bit and they'll swell up for a few days. But uh, for the most part, they've just kind of shrug it off and, and keep going. I mean, they learn their lesson. They don't mess with snakes after that, but it yeah. doesn't, you know, doesn't kill them or anything, which is weird because they're a lot smaller than us, too. But Right. Yeah, that is weird. We're just weak. We as humans have just, yeah, gotten very weak as We're the soft. generations have gone by. <laughs> yeah, no, we are. And I just, I don't know. Snakes is just one of those things, like, I'm almost less of, like, I know a bear encounter would be way worse than a snake encounter, but I'm almost less afraid of the bear encounter because there's a good chance I'm going to see it coming. I'm like, oh, shit, there's a bear. You know, this probably isn't going to go well. Right. There's a snake. It's one of those things where, like, when you don't know it's there and it just sneaks up on you, it it just the thought of it makes it worse. Right. And I feel like I I mean I've never hunted in grizzly country uh, for the record, but I feel like a lot of the times you can see an encounter coming and do something to avoid it. You know, oh, hey, there's a there's a bear, or this is bear country. Let's let's make noise while we're we're hiking or whatever. You have your protection, whatever. But like you said, yeah, you, you don't see the snake until it's too late you're stepping on it <laughs> usually yeah yeah usually um i think a lot of times there's some people get surprised by bears too i mean it yeah, happens sure. but very few hunters get killed by bears i mean i think on i think we just had one a couple of years ago or the last year where an outfitter got killed by a bear which is really sad mm. but overall statistically like out of all bear encounters very few hunters actually get killed because of like what you're talking about they see it coming there's preventative measures there's protective actions i mean there's a lot of things you can do to help your chances a lot of times like just a bear mauling isn't lethal you know they won't try to kill you they're just trying to defend their cubs or there's a lot of things like at play with the snake thing it's like there's not really much to do other than wear snake boots or snake gaiters and hope you don't get hit yeah you know and it's not too common around here either in fact the few snake bites that you hear about every year it's usually like young kids that are out playing, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So as hunters, you know, you don't really hear about it. And I think that's because we are kind of watching where we're going. You don't want to make yeah. too much noise, you know, or yeah. you're looking for sheds on the ground or whatever. So you're, you're kind of keeping an eye on where you're walking, but it's something that's always in the back of my mind, except December, January. Again, I know people that have found them in December, January, but I've never ran across one either of those months. So I'm kind of in back of my mind. I'm like carefree when I'm out hunting those two yeah. months. <laughs> well, we were just in New Mexico in April shed hunting and the tech guy's like, Oh, there's snakes here, but we don't really see them. And I was like, all right, whatever, you know, running around all day long. But yeah, there's some steep, steep stuff, some rocks. I mean, looking back, I'd never thought of snakes and we were climbing up rock cliffs and doing all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, Oh, well, surprised we didn't see a snake then. Right. Because you'd think by April they'd be coming out. Yeah, and I think your elevation has a lot to play, in, a lot to do with it as well. We were low, which we'll is, go, I don't think it's good. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, we'll go shed hunting, you know, in higher elevations in April, May, and I don't think I've ever ran across too many up there. But the second you drop down into those lower elevations, like, it's always, all right, here we, we go. Got to keep an eye out now. We were in, like, the Mesa country of northern New Mexico. Mm hmm I don't know how many snakes are in that area, but it was nothing was high elevation. I mean, you'd go up 300 feet and then down 300 feet. Right. It was just mesas. So, yeah, that's, I don't know. What's the, I've never seen a live rattlesnake in the wild. I saw a dead one once when we went to the Devil's Tower in Nebraska or whatever, Chimney Rock in Nebraska. The parking lot for the visitor center has a sign that says, beware of rattlesnakes. I'm like, ah, whatever. They probably just have to put a <laughs> sign there. And so I'm walking on the sidewalk. And I look down and a foot off the sidewalk, there's a rattlesnake. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I jump and ran. And then we look back to investigate and it was missing a head. And, and so someone already killed it. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's crazy. And then we walk up and there's you know a bloody shovel right next to the door of the visitor center. And so I asked and they're like, yeah, the lady that went to hang the flag this morning found it. It was right underneath the flagpole. I'm like, seriously? And she's like, oh, yeah, that's like the eighth one we've killed this year. And it was like June. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I would not be able to handle this pressure. Jeez. Yeah, it, some years they're bad, some years they're not. This year I haven't personally ran into a, a lot, but um, 
my dad, you know, where I grew up, my childhood home, he uh, still lives there. He's killed, I think, probably eight or nine this year in his yard. So, I mean, it's just, just use kinda... a shovel or what's the, what's the best way? Or yeah, shovel just shovel. Yeah. That's yeah. generally, I mean, if you're out hunting and you have a gun on you, you can try to shoot it, I guess, but usually a big solid rock or a shovel is probably your best bet. <laughs> yeah. And all these randos that pick them up. Oh, no. Nah. Like there's, isn't there a lot of people that will like go catch snakes, even if they're poisonous? I mean, like Steve Irwin used to do it all the time. Right. Um, I just, I don't understand it. I, I completely don't understand. Like the whole risk reward calculation in my mind doesn't even register. <laughs> like, no, I'm going to do with this poisonous snake once you do catch it. No, I'm the same way. I want nothing to do with them. And again, that's, that's why I live all year, save up all my vacation time at work for December, January. Those are, those are the two prime months around here. Okay. So as coos, would you say coos deer is your like overall main, the main thing you hunt or like if you had to pick like your, your um, slogan species, like what would it be? Is it, is it the coos deer hunt in December, January, like you said, or is it elk or? Uh, no, I'd probably say coos deer. I, I love elk hunting as much as anybody, but. Even, I mean, even as a resident here in Arizona, tags are hard to get. Yeah. Um, I think I've only had in my entire life, two archery elk tags here. And, yeah. uh, I've had two in New Mexico as a non-resident. So I've actually drawn just as many tags as a non-resident in New Mexico as my home state. But I think if I hunted elk a little more, maybe I'd, you know, lean that way. But these coos deer, man, they, they're addicting and you can hunt them a lot of different times of the year from you know yeah. august to january so yeah i mean it does it does really come down to what are you able to hunt what's your opportunity but mm -hmm. i did see i mean you your new mexico bull for sure obviously it's pinned on your page but that is a toad of a bull and so i was just curious because you, you it seems like you've had success with very mature animals in both species so i was just curious what your thoughts were on which one's the preference, but you're right. I mean, if it's two tags and a light, like so far, you know, a tag every decade, it's kind of right. hard to say that's what I hunt. And you know, mm -hmm. Oh, so you only hunt one year every decade. You're like, yeah, pretty much. Right. <laughs> well, and with elk, you know, I try to get out every year with friends or family when they have tags or mm -hmm. I've been meaning to head up, you know, do like Colorado or something. And I'm building points in other States, but you know, for my own hunts and tags, it's just you kind of take what you can get. Um, but that, that New Mexico bull so far is my biggest bull to date, but he was not expected. I was going to shoot whatever because it was a very mid-tier unit that I was hunting. So any branch antler bull was going to be on the hit list on that hunt, but I got lucky. <laughs> yeah. So in New Mexico, for those that don't know, there's no point system, which is really great. I really like it. Mm -hmm. It's just a straight lottery. Some units are better than others. So they get more apps and maybe have less tags. And so, you know, I think what the Gila is like two, 3% chance of drawing that tag versus some of the other places that are like 35% chance. Right. And I suppose that's, still just archery like if you pick some of these nuanced seasons maybe like a late rifle or maybe you can even get a little bit better chances but is that how you kind of approach it uh, you're wearing the go hunt hat so i you know assume you're using the insider and you're like ah 20 percent seems like a good level like what's my best 20 percent unit that i could go to or do you have like just specific units you want to hunt because of the landscape uh well the unit that I killed that bull in, I've actually hunted for years for deer, just because it's kind of close by um, mm. where I live. I, I don't live too far from New Mexico. And okay. so over the years of hunting deer in New Mexico, I saw the occasional elk. I was like, I want to hunt elk here. And uh, I drew an archery tag in that unit. This was years ago and had a good hunt. Didn't end up killing anything, but saw some good bulls and was like, all right, I want to hunt this again. And so with New Mexico, you get three options, right? You got your first choice, second, third. And so what I'll usually do is my first choice, I'm swinging for the fences and putting a hunt that I really want. Mm -hmm. And then my second and third, I'm applying for really high odds hunts. I just want a tag so I can go hunting. And 
even though this unit is definitely what I would consider a mid-tier unit for elk, I'm still putting it as my first choice just because I know it pretty well and it's close right. by so I could scout it. And that's kind of what led to my bull last year is I drew my first choice, which was that unit. And I had already hunted it before for deer and for elk at that point. So I kind of hit the ground running and it helped out a lot. Oh, I think that's, I think very helpful to have experience in a unit. I think you can overcome that. Like if you draw a true glory tag and you do lots of research, like that might make it easier to tag out. Mm -hmm. But other than like glory tags, just having an experience in the unit, I think is by far the best. Just curious, how often, you know, out of 10 years, how often do you think you could draw that same tag in New Mexico? Is it like one out of 10, one, two times in a decade? I I think my hope is I'm going to be drawing it every two to three years. So that tracks, I've drawn it about every third year I've applied for it. I've had it twice now. So you get pulled. So yeah, throughout your lifetime, you're going to get plenty of experience in that unit and just better and better every time. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's the idea. (laughs) That's the problem. As much as I love New Mexico system for how simple it is, and how, you know, some of these states like Colorado is true preference. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm mathematically out of the running for ever drawing a Northwestern glory tag in Colorado. Because mm-hmm. I'm so far behind on points, it'll take, it'll take, like, they're like, oh, it's a 29-point draw. So, in 29 years, I'll draw it. It's like, well, no, because there might be, if there's, you know, 10,000 people ahead of me in the point scale that are applying for that unit, and they're giving out a hundred tags a year, it's going to take a thousand years, right? Is that the math? A hundred years. It's going to take a hundred years to cycle through all those people ahead of me, which right. is point creep. Right. And so I'm going to have to live a hundred years. So by the time I could draw, it's going to be a hundred point unit. And I'm mm-hmm. obviously not going to be around a hundred years from now. So that's the, like, I'm mathematically out of the running. The right. same thing for a lot of the MSG takes, like the moose, sheep and goat takes and the lower 48 you're just mathematically out because they give away three tags a year and there's a hundred thousand people that want one. Right. You know, and that that's really come into play in my strategy for building points in all these other States. You know, I've, I've stopped applying for points for certain species or even certain States based on, you know, point creep. And just, it feels like I was just throwing away that money every year because mathematically, you know, I'll probably never draw a tag I really want. So it's either, cash in what I have, or just, you know, again, with like the sheep and moose and stuff like that. It, I'm almost in my mind, I was like, eh, I'm better off saving that money and application fees and license fees and everything, saving that money and just doing like an Alaska moose hunt or something, you know what I mean? Or, or whatever. Yeah. Ontario, but, British Columbia, the sheep right. thing, there is not a good solution. No, there's thing. not. <laughs> moose hunting, there's still some good options. Um, Mm -hmm. there really is sheep hunting. If you want to be a sheep hunter, get a good job. Yeah. Like, and when I say good job, I mean, get a phenomenal job. I mean, go figure out how you can make 250 grand a year and then you, you could probably sheep hunt. And then you could sheep hunt a little more than the average person. (laughs) Well, the average person, I mean, so it's like British Columbia is like 70,000, 80,000 for a sheep hunt these days. Right. Um, and so it's like, imagine that. Imagine spending eighty thousand dollars on a one-week vacation, and like the impact that has to your family. Now, if you're a single person making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year, yeah, you probably do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. But if you're making that much money and you got a family, like you have a house, you probably have a mortgage, you probably have cars, bills, kids. I mean, everything just adds. And now you're gonna go spend eighty thousand dollars on this hunt. It's just like, yeah, sheep are cool, but are they that cool? Like, is it? That's where I'm at. I would love to do the hunt. And yeah. if it was $10,000, maybe I'd do it one day. But, you know, by the time I, it's, it's kind of point creep. By the time I save the money, it's going to be $140,000 to do a sheep hunt instead of 80000 It's like, am I going to spend the average house in America to shoot a sheep? <laughs> no, I agree. I, I've been looking at prices for hunts like that just recently. So I'm thinking about selling one of my investment properties next year. And with that money, I'm like, man, I want to go do like a, a bucket list hunt. Right. And for the money I could spend on like a sheep hunt in my mind, I'm like, man, I could go on three or four or five other hunts for the same price. You know what I mean? I don't have like one species that I'm just like, 
man, I got to go hunt sheep. I, I'm more of like, man, I want to go to Alaska, but I could go do like a caribou hunt or a moose yeah. hunt or even like a mountain go hunt in Alaska for a fraction of the price of a doll sheep hunt. So that that's where I'm at too. I'm just like, I'd love to do it. And the adventure aspect of it seems amazing, but for the price, it's like, man, I could go on some epic hunts, you know, a few of them for the same price. So, yeah, well, and I, first of all, you brought up a, a curiosity of mine because I'm very, I have another podcast, a business entrepreneurship podcast called two bucks. So the bucks that grow antlers and the bucks that pay for them. <laughs> um, but so when you say investment property, I'd almost be like, if it were me, I'd probably scale, like sell the investment property, take the, the equity gains you've had over the years, scale up into a new one. And it's like, how do we get this investment property situation so that it's cash flowing my sheep hunt? You know, because man, like I hear you, you work so hard to build up or like you work so hard to get the savings and it's just gone. Like that's where I'd, you know, kind of go back to the same thing, like a hundred and whatever thousand dollars to do a sheep hunt one day versus I could buy a farm for that. Like I could buy a 40 acre whitetail farm somewhere. I could shoot a hundred deer off of it in my lifetime. And it's an investment. I didn't lose my money because it's still there. Right. You know, so a lot of, yeah, like you said, there's so many things you can do. And that's one species where I don't have a great option. I mean, I use go hunt. I've got, I think I just looked it up. I've got 89 points across the West different states and different species and some states are like yeah i don't know when i'm gonna cash these in like utah i don't have no idea when i'm gonna cash in my utah points colorado i buy points in colorado montana wyoming arizona and i have a pretty good plan um wyoming montana are the general units so we just cycle back and forth i think wyoming right now is in between three and a four point draw montana's zero one two kind of they got a goofy system but you can typically get it every other year as mm -hmm. of right now which is going to get worse colorado over the counter we fill in the gaps and so it'll be like wyoming montana well i flip it over montana wyoming montana colorado and then montana wyoming you know because the wyoming one kind of really throws a wrench in it when you can only go once every four years confidently right. and then the points in colorado I'm looking for that mid tier, that unit that's going to set aside, you know, set aside a, a significant difference between over the counter, right? So less pressure, maybe just that one step up in quality, by no means a trophy unit. Like I'm not wasting 20 years. I'm, this is, I'm thinking five to 10. Right. And then Arizona, Arizona, part, the strategy I have is really targeting that that next level, maybe not quite like a limited, like a once in a lifetime, maybe not quite like a true trophy. Like I'm probably not looking for what is, the, what are some of the trophy areas in Arizona? Cause the Gila is in New Mexico, like right? Nine and 10 or yeah. uh, one and yeah. 27. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like one step down for that. We're like, there's the potential for a solid bull, you know, Mm -hmm. 350 370 they're here you got to work for them though not the unit 10 where it's like yeah you can i'm not looking for 400 potential i'm looking for like there could be a 370 but just shooting a 320 a 330 a great bull mm -hmm. you know and so that might be like a 10 year unit with you know late or something like late archery or late rifle not obviously like the first season archery Right. Yeah, that, that unit probably goes 15, 20 points. And right. so that's the cycle that I use. Now I have the points in Nevada. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I have points in Utah. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, probably because I've listened to too many Ryan Carter podcasts talking about giant elk and the Dutton and the, <laughs> in the, in the plateau. Um, but I'll, I'll burn them eventually. But then you have the wild cards like New Mexico and Idaho. Idaho is kind of an over the counter option again, just like Colorado. And then New Mexico, that's that can be your wild card state. I mean, I could apply for the Gila every year in New Mexico, and I might get it once, maybe twice in my lifetime. Um, and so that's kind of my elk strategy. And since I got out of high school or college, I've done one a year, and then one year I got two. I did draw, I drew a once in a lifetime in North Dakota, hmm. but that strategy has served us good. I mean, we obviously don't tag out. We've never tagged out in our group, but we've generally. I think our average is at least a bull a year. Right. So I mean, as long as you're hunting every year, I, I think a lot of guys, at least here, 
where even as a resident, you could go 10, 15 years without, you know, an elk tag. A lot well, of guys just yeah. aren't hunting elk, you know, and they're, they're losing that experience. So you got to find something. It's funny the difference. So, you know, people in Arizona go, yeah, I hunt elk once every 10 years because it's so hard to draw in my state. Well, the difference is it is so hard to draw in Minnesota. There is like six tags a year and there's a hundred thousand people that apply for them. <laughs> and so it's like, well, if I don't leave my state, I'm never going to hunt elk. And right. so it, because we're so much harder to draw virtually zero, like you have to leave. And then once mm-hmm. you're in that mindset of like traveling, then it's easy to like, well, we do it every year. We just go to Wyoming this year or Colorado. I mean, it doesn't matter. We go every year versus someone like, like you said, in Arizona, we're like, well, I just go every 10 years because that's how long it takes to draw a state. But since it's like in that middle zone where it's possible, it's almost like they never think, well, I could just go to another state. I could go to Colorado. You know, a lot of people do, but some people are probably kind of trapped in that mindset. And, and I think that's it because, yeah, on average, you can kind of guess when you're going to draw a tag. But there's always that chance you could draw any given year. You yeah. know, my dad, he drew three Arizona archery elk tags in a great unit three years in a row. Oh my gosh. That's, that's just unheard of, you know, but it, it can happen. I'm not that lucky. I've never done anything like that, but you know, I think people hold on to that hope. And then when it doesn't happen, they're like, well, maybe next year and don't aren't willing to go anywhere else. That does, it does complicate things. So two things there, you know, like New Mexico, it's great that their system is set up the way it is. I, I really do like it because the whole point creep thing, it's just, oh man, I don't mm-hmm. like it. It doesn't make me feel good knowing there's certain units I'll never be able to hunt. Mm-hmm. Like mathematically never, zero. Right. Unless giant change happens in legislation, tag allocation, herd popular. I mean, tons of things would have to change for me to ever hunt the northwest corner of Colorado. Mm-hmm. So I like that. What I don't like about it is you can also never plan on it. And when you have, like, we have eight guys in our archery group. First of all, not a lot of units in New Mexico have eight non-resident tags. So right off the bat, we can't apply for any of those places. Right. And and the chances of all of us getting drawn are virtually zero because we basically have to get drawn on the first app, right? Other mm-hmm. Depends on how every state does their non-resident apps, right? So some states will look at it and they'll say we have eight non-resident tags. So if this group of party of eight draws on the first one, great. They get the eight takes. If they draw on the second one, there's not eight takes left. So they get kicked out. Other states will say uh, they drew. So we'll just increase it to 15 this year. You know what I mean? Like it it can get kind of goofy. Some states do it both ways. And so you got to keep that in mind. The other thing is you got to front the money in New Mexico. So you got $1,200 sitting out there. And then you have other apps. And it's like, well, what happens if I drew New Mexico, but I also drew Wyoming and maybe Wyoming, I, you have to look up what their return policies are. Like, obviously, you're not returning the New Mexico tag because that's the good one. And, you know, it's not like you get your point. You know what I mean? So it's right. it's messy to try to apply to these places that that you can't bank on odds, too. So it's not like it's mm-hmm. – there's no silver bullet, really. You just got to roll the dice and blow with the wind. Yeah, and try to make the most of it when it does happen. You know, I the first year I applied for New Mexico – it wasn't the first year I'd been hunting deer there for years, but um, started making a little more money at my day job. So I'm like, I'm going to apply for elk and antelope and, you know, some of these other species. And that first year I applied for elk, antelope, uh, deer, and Barbary sheep. And I drew, <laughs> I drew all four of them. And oh, so no. <laughs> I was out all that money. And then <laughs> I had to, you know, ration out my vacation time at work. And then I had Arizona hunts as well. So it, it ended up being a great year. That's the year I killed that great buck, you know, antelope buck in New Mexico. And I, I hunted that elk unit. I didn't kill elk, but I got familiar with it as far as elk goes. And I killed a Barbary sheep and everything else and had a great time, but you can't bank on things. You just kind of, you know, when they come, they come and you got to make the most of it. Yeah, is the Barbary sheep what I'm looking at, or is this an? Did you shoot an ibex as well? Uh, if it, I've only killed the Barbary sheep, I haven't drawn okay. an ibex. Yeah, I'm not familiar with some of these exotics. Yeah, New Mexico's got a few of them. <laughs> yeah, isn't that crazy? Like some, like in Texas, is like all of the like every animal on planet Earth. You yep. can find one in Texas. Yep. Yeah, if you, there's ever something you want to kill, I'm pretty sure Texas has it. And it's probably no season, so you can just go do it. 
<laughs> yeah, I think so. I, I've never hunted Texas, so I, I, I'm not positive, but, uh, New Mexico has got a couple, couple of exotics that I've only drawn the Barbary and they're, they're a lot of fun. They remind me of coos deer. Honestly, they live in the same kind of habitat. Really? And they, the way you hunt them is just super similar and they've been a lot of fun. We, we try to, you know, usually somebody in our group draws a tag every year. So they're a lot of fun to hunt, but I'm, I'm holding out for either an Oryx or an Ibex tag. That's, that's what I want to do next, but those are a lot harder to draw. So, yeah, they are for sure. My next, obviously I would love to shoot a big bull elk with my bow. I mean, who wouldn't, but aside from that, I really want a mule deer tag in a unit that's good enough to like pass on bucks. I've never, I've always had general units and it's always been like really tough drought years. Not a lot of deer. It's like, you better shoot the first like branch antler buck you see, cause it's going to mm -hmm. be the last. And I have, and I've tagged out every time, but it's, you know, just, it's, it's to me, it's a different hunt when it's like, shoot the first, you know, like sh I got to shoot the first one. Like I have, I would rather be able to look at a deer and appreciate it and really take a deep look at him and be like, yeah, is he the one? I don't know. We'll come back to him later. We'll go find another one. Kind of like how you antelope hunt. And yeah. there's not a lot of units like that, especially as a non-resident where you can't glass and scout and really know these areas. But that's one thing I'd really love to do. And, and I mean, I don't have like dreams of a 200 or anything. I just want to shoot a nice four by four with a good frame, nice forks. You know, I'd be tickled pink with 150, 160 inch mule deer. I, I just want to look at some. Right. Yeah. Uh, come down to Arizona in January. That That's a fun time to hunt mule deer as well. They That's when you get a, you know, really take a look at everything that's really out there because they're hard to find other times of the year, you know, the general rifle hunts and whatnot. But when that rut kicks in December or January, it brings all those big desert mule deer bucks out of the flats where they're hard to find. And I, I've gotten on some amazing deer in January, my bow, but I've yet to connect on one of those giants. I, every year I get distracted by the coos deer, but you look, <laughs> down into the, you look down into the mule deer country, man, there's some good bucks down there. When is, um, when is the, you know, I, I, lo I think shooting them with a bow is more fun, but there's something to be said for the confidence I have behind my 300 <laughs> wind mag and a 25 power scope with a bipod and I'm like, you're dead. Yep. As soon as I pull this trigger, you're dead. Yep. And so when's the rifle season in New Mexico or Arizona? Is it really hard to draw like a rifle mule deer tag in some of those places? Uh, a general rifle tag in like October, November, they're actually pretty easy. Yeah. Um, they have a few units where they have like a December trophy hunt and those can be pretty hard to get. Um, but if you want to go, you know, October, November, obviously it's going to be a lot warmer, but those ones aren't yeah. too bad to draw. Yeah. And then the archery, it, like the December, January during the rut is archery only, unless you get one of those trophy yeah. tags. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't, I'm not dead. I, I, listen, it would be a great skill set to start getting good at of spot stock game, which is not something I do a lot of because we tree stand hunt mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then elk hunting isesn't really spot and stock. We do black timber or calling, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't really do a lot of spot and stock. So it'd be a great skill to start practicing and start getting good at because you're going to shoot a lot more game, especially units like that, if you can spot and stock some mule deer. But right. yeah, I wouldn't be opposed, man. I definitely wouldn't be opposed. It sounds like a fun time and nothing else is going on. I mean, other than blowing snow up here in Minnesota, nothing <laughs> else in January going on. Yeah, I mean, it falls, it falls in pretty good with, you know, a lot of other states and the way the seasons fall, it gives you yeah. something to do. And especially January, I don't feel like there's a whole lot of other hunts going on. So no, not, not up here anyway, pretty much everything closes up end of the year. And so you people ice fish, I don't do a lot of ice fishing and I would definitely trade ice fishing for a mule deer hunt. Don't, <laughs> don't get me wrong there, but yeah. And then February I start usually start up a little shed hunting and then hit that hard through mm. April. Usually by May I'm done. Unless I'm going out west. So, hmm. yeah, great time. Great thing to fit it in. Especially, we have a week shutdown at my company. Really? The entire, like, it's usually about a 12-day shutdown that covers, like, Christmas to New Year's. Hmm. So, maybe not 12. Yeah, yeah, it's usually 12 days. Um, And so, obviously, I got to do that Christmas thing. But 
I could still do like a five day vacation. Right. Yeah. I think I'm going to do that this year. I didn't draw a lot of tags. So I've taken off almost the whole month of December. I've saved up all my vacation. <laughs> my job's not very happy with me, but I'm like, Hey, I got nothing else to do this year. And that's when I'm going to use it. And they're like, all right, we'll see you in January. <laughs> yeah, it works. Or can you bank vacation? Uh, no, I got to use it by end of the year. So my, oh, my, my yeah. vacation time will reset come January. And I, I try not to burn too much of it in January. Every now and then I'll take a couple days here or there if I'm on a good yeah. rock or something, you know, and, you know, the hunting's good. But I, I have a pretty good work schedule anyway where I get like five days off in a row. I'll work five and then I'm off five. So, oh, yeah, uh, I awesome. try not to take too much vacation in case I get like elk tags or something later in the year. I can right. take more time off. So, yeah, that's phenomenal. So cool. Well, whenever I draw that uh, Arizona archery mule deer tag, I'll let you know. And then we can tell you. I don't even care if you tell me where the deer are. Just tell me where the rattlesnakes aren't. And I know it's January, <laughs> so there's not going to be a lot of them, but I still want to be <laughs> prepared. Yeah, you'll be set in January. Not a lot <laughs> of them running around anyway. Good. That's perfect. So, but man, Steven, it's been a great podcast having you on here in a little bit. I don't think we've ever done a coos deer episode. I'd, I'd call this a coos deer episode. I don't think we've ever done that. So, um, cool option. We didn't even get into some of the other stuff like Avelina or, or shed hunting that you do, but, um, we'll have to get you back on and talk about Havelina Cause that's another thing that would be on my list of, of, I don't know, not bucket list. Like, I feel like when you say bucket list, it's gotta be like an Alaskan Yukon moose and a doll sheep. It's like, well, it's on bucket list, but I just want to shoot a, I want I to want shoot it, a yeah. hog. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're a lot of fun with a bow too. And it's in January as well. So you kind of get uh, two birds with one stone deer and javelina with your bow. <laughs> and it's warm. So I can convince my wife it's a vacation, not a hunt. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for being here, Steven. Uh, real quick, before we wrap up, give people a chance to follow you, run through where they can connect with you, follow along with all your adventures. Where can they find you at? Uh, just follow me on Instagram. Uh, I do a little bit on TikTok as well, but, uh, just master the hunt on Instagram, TikTok or my YouTube. So find me there. Perfect. Perfect. We can put the links in the show notes for anyone that wants to follow along and learn a little bit more about coos deer hunting from you. And we'll go with that. Cool. I appreciate it, man. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here, Steven. And thank you for listening folks.